Hello and welcome again to everyone. I am Patricia Stewart Hopkins and I am a licensed clinical counselor as well as an educator. I teach at Lindsay Wilson in their graduate program. And I'm also a local Winchester resident. I know many of you from my work in the community and I'm just so grateful to be a part of the many teams involved in Clark County that have really promoted wellness during this uncertain time. I'd also like to introduce Maggie. Maggie Goff is a wellness expert and she has delivered trainings in person and through webinar to promote wellness all over the country. She will be sharing some very valuable resources that were created uh, for sharing with WellCOA, and those will be accessible in our web resource page that's associated with your registration to this webinar today. I'd also like to introduce Bradley Bertner, LCSW. He is in private practice and has a history of being a very active community partner in his work while he was Clinic Coordinator at Mountain Comprehensive Care. So we are gathered here today to start a conversation or perhaps continue the conversation that you have already started around how do we respond in this uncertain time of COVID-19. And I'd like to say that there's not a best answer because the experiences we're having are both collective and unique. This morning, I listened to an expert who described it in this way. We are all experiencing the same storm and we are aboard very different ships in our experience. So I'd like to recognize your unique experience as well as talk about the collective experience that we're having as we navigate these uncertain times. So initially I'd like to say if you are experiencing some loss, a loss of job, a loss of status, a loss of uh, someone who is close to you, let us share condolences for that loss. It's, it's important to remark on that and notice that experience. I know that there are some educators uh, on our call this morning and they are experiencing a loss as well because they have become somewhat disconnected from the classroom setting, although they've done an, I think, exemplary job of reaching out during this time. So you're here to learn more about this collective experience of trauma. And that word can, can be kind of scary in and of itself, but I'd like to make it more relatable to you. So trauma is not just about child abuse. It's not just about um, a return from war and those experiences. Today, we wanna to talk about trauma as it relates to our collective experience, what we are feeling, observing, and doing in response to COVID-19. Each of us here has been deemed responsible for the caretaking of children or students or employees. And in doing so, we are being asked to do things that we've never experienced before. And that creates some anxiety. It can also create some sense of helplessness at times. And we experience trauma when we are in a prolonged state or experience with helplessness. So that's an important definition to remember because our children are in fact often in an alarm response or a trauma state given that they experience a great deal of their day as being helpless both before COVID-19 and now, depending on their age. So I just want to encourage you that if you are having a difficult time managing 
your feelings, managing your, your thoughts, your actions right now, to understand that that is perfectly normal, even though the media might have you believe that it's not. You are not alone in your fear of sickness, in your fear or grief as related to loss of work, purpose, meaning, disconnection from love and belonging. All of those things that you are experiencing are normal given the circumstances that we are all existing in right now. And when we have that trauma experience, it creates an impact biologically for us that is automatic, it's reflexive, and it's not something we initiate intentionally. So when you are observing both yourself and people in your care, do you notice someone that's looking especially tired? Maybe you've noticed your own lack of interest in showering, shaving. Um, it took me longer to put on makeup. I thought I forgot how this morning. So we are having some of those experiences. You might notice that in Zoom calls, people appear to be somewhere else. That could be for a variety of reasons. They could be experiencing what I'm calling COVID fog, uh, which is associated with our brain response um, and difficulty attending to things given our trauma experience or prolonged stress. Or perhaps they are experiencing um, the alarm that happens when you don't know where your child is in the house. <laughs> or perhaps they're experiencing the alarm that happens when you realize your child has a week left of schoolwork to do and it's due tomorrow. Or perhaps they are experiencing some COVID fog as related to loss of work or financial access and resources. And so many of us <laughs> are juggling all of those responsibilities and it is having an impact on our overall wellness. And that's part of the conversation that I wanna to continue today. The more we can bring forward these ideas and how they're connected to the stress response, both neurologically um, and in our mental, physical, spiritual well-being, the more we will feel able to control the factors that are being impacted. So, I'd like to turn it over to Bradley for a moment to talk about more broadly his experience in serving as a helper in dealing with the information that people are receiving day in and day out. Yeah, it's what I would say is that every client that I have provided services to since this began has wanted to talk about this directly or indirectly, has been impacted by it directly or indirectly. And I think what Patricia is doing this afternoon is getting us started unpacking this a little bit. What does it really mean to experience this? What does it feel like? What does it smell like, right? She talked about people being less inclined to uh, put on their makeup or wash their hair. And I, when ironically, we need to be paying as much attention as we can to hygiene right now. Um, I think that where Patricia started us with there being one storm and many ships is a great visual for this. Because in private practice, I am seeing the whole continuum. There are people that believe that this is uh, going to be to some extent, fatal for all of us. And then other people who believe 
that there's something conspiratorial about this. And the truth, maybe, is somewhere in between. But I think that what's more important is the way people are experiencing it. Um, let, me, we, let me bring this up, Patricia, and then I will volley it back to you because this just happened in a session that I was in with a client who is in, uh, in one of the life-sustaining jobs. So she has continued to work. She has continued to work with the public. And she talked about the impact of her having a mask on her face and her job. And she talked about feeling the anger of some people that were coming in to her place of business. She talked about feeling the fear of some of the people that were coming into her place of business. And maybe they're angry because she's got on a mask and they're thinking, well, you don't need to have on a mask. Or maybe they're scared because she's got on a mask, but she's not wearing gloves. Well, you should have on gloves too. One thing that she and I discussed though is perhaps they're sad as well because when they walk into that place of business where if they had walked into the same place of business in November of 19, December of 19, January of 20, she would not have had a mask on. But she's got one on now and it is a reminder of not just where we are, but where we are not, and that something is lost. And I think something I have thought about from the very beginning of this, Patricia, and I just wanna share with the group, is that people are grieving. People are angry and people are scared, but people are also very sad. And uh, this storm, uh, is bringing up all kinds of emotions. And to go back to where I started commenting on how you started us off, Patricia, I think beginning to unpack all of that is important. So it's not just one big funk that we can begin to dissect it and think about what we're feeling and why. So this trauma experience is a completely natural biological response to the unnatural state of helplessness that we are in as a result of our unnatural experience related to COVID-19. So again, it's completely normal that you are having these responses and reactions and I think one of the main messages that we want to send out today is one of turning your compassion inward and extending forgiveness to yourself for the struggle that is present for all of us. Uh, given that analogy of the ships being different that we are sailing on today, I'd also like to introduce this window of tolerance concept. So we all have kind of a baseline level of functioning where we exist and function effectively for the most part. We might have a little bounce from the waves on our ship, but generally we are navigating in a safe space. With the unnatural COVID storm, our ability to respond and react and return to the safe space has been impacted neurologically. And so, that makes it far more difficult to do the things that we were doing and managing in both our work and in our relationships prior to COVID-19. So another take home point today is to figure out how can you expand upon your readiness and ability to respond and react appropriately given your window of tolerance has narrowed. So when we 
put effort towards returning to calm, returning to that safe space where we function at our best. We are smarter, stronger, faster, more creative, and the list goes on and on. Some people describe that experience as flow. You know when you're in a flow, right? Um, there are different times of the day where you are more optimally functioning, and you may be experiencing a little less flow in today's times. However, with intentionality, you can return your focus to body-based experiences and find calm and come out of that alarm response back into your safe space where you find your flow. As a parent, a leader, an educator, let's pray a little bit about being steady and being right when it's impossible to be untouched by the current state of affairs. Let's focus our energy in observing, inviting, listening, and responding. One of the ways that we can do this is by being transparent, by allowing for some vulnerability, it can make others feel less insular, less alone, more validated in their own experience of fear, loss, dread, and uncertainty. Bradley, you wanna say a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I, I just want to, as well, double down on something that, that you have said a couple of different ways that I want everyone to take with them as as they as they leave here uh, as as they as they as we continue this conversation about this that what is happening right now is 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 novel if i may as in you know the, the, the it, it's novel it's new uh it, there's nothing normal about this and so it is actually these feelings that we have, uh, and Patricia has been talking about the science of it, these biological responses, uh, which influence and form emotional responses and vice versa. If I'm angry about this, if I'm sad about this, if I'm scared about this, that's actually right on target. That's not the wrong way to feel about any of this. You know, Patricia used the phrase being self-compassionate with ourselves. And that's something that in my practice, I try to talk a lot to people about is, let's not fight with what we're feeling. We're feeling bad, we're feeling sad, we're feeling scared, we're feeling dread, we're feeling resentment. Well, that's what you're feeling. Allow yourself to feel that. Have some self-compassion and also recognize that that response is actually pretty natural to what we're, what we're doing right now, to what's going on right now. It is uh, hard not to miss. You know, in terms of what Patricia talked about, um, authenticity. Patricia, is that what you want me to talk about? I think is is yeah okay. The I want to give an example of a uh, client that I was working with, um, and it, it 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 may seem that it better fits in talking to someone that's that's a leader or a manager, but I think it actually applies to someone that is uh, managing or regulating a household. Basically, he told me that uh, in his business, uh, again, it's a life-sustaining business, so it's 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 open right now. Um, he's the boss, and he has people that report to him that are looking to him to lead to regulate, to manage, to mitigate. And he said that his practice 
uh, had always been to be steady, you know, never let them see me sweat. And that, I don't know, two or three weeks ago when we were having this conversation, when we were about five or six weeks into what we're all experiencing, he said he had a bad day at work and that he uh, had not slept well and that he was irritable with some of the people that he supervises and that he may have lost his temper and that he may have lashed out, said things that he wouldn't normally say. And we were processing it together and he was being really hard on himself and like, you know, I, I got to do better. I can't let him see me sweat. But what we both considered, well, maybe if they got to see you sweat a little bit, maybe if they saw that you are impacted by this too, maybe if they see that you're authentic, maybe that actually connects you with them in a way. And so what he and I arrived at is during this time, maybe steadiness is not exactly what we need to go for. Maybe some authenticity is what is required. Because those people that he's supervising now know that he's in the storm too, to come back to Patricia's analogy. That it's not like he's in a helicopter <laughs> uh, removed from it. He's, on the, he's in the water too. And I just, I think even as parents, people that uh, are within the family, um, guess what? Not only is it okay for them to see you sweat, they're, they're seeing it anyway. So don't try to pretend that they can't see it. And the other thing is uh, demonstrating to, to, to children, demonstrating uh, to people that you have influence over how to uh, navigate a, uh, a troubled time, there's great power in that. Being, authentic, being, being uh, authentic when you're uncertain, there's power in that. So simply put, maybe we shouldn't wear ourselves out trying to be steady when authenticity um, may bring us closer to those that we love, those that we can inspire. Um, Bradley, if I could add to that, um, I'm a business owner myself and our business was hit pretty significantly really early on. And um, so we spent the first week or so in, let me back up and say, as a well-being expert, I was watching this thing coming and thinking, okay, so if we're in pandemic time, which is what I've been calling it for a while, and we're all forced to slow down, like as a well-being person, I'm like, well, these are things that I've been, you know, beating the drum about for a long time. Maybe this won't be so bad for us. And I was kind of almost like looking forward to it for some personal self-care. Um, and then like my business, it just had not been realistic about the impact it would have on my own business. And so me and my little team, you know, we really cranked out some work. And there were many times that I would have to say to my children, because I'm in my home with three small children, I'd have to say, I have to work on this. I have to take care of this. Um, and then I can be with you, you know? And so, you know, it was modeling, I think that boundary setting in a very authentic way. But Finally, after about two weeks of just like cranking and pushing and pivoting my business for survival um, so that my employees had jobs, right? And filling out all of the small business disaster things and all the things. Um, I finally just said to my employees one team meeting on a Monday, I said, um, I'm gonna do just what I have to do and then I'm gonna quit for the day. And I would, I found myself like each, new day trying to come back and do do stuff again but then I would say um no I'm, I have to quit again for the day because I was to Patricia's point I was not I could not get back to that calm place like I couldn't even thread the needle through the window so I just had to keep quitting and my employees actually said to me 
literally, thank God. Like we, one of them said, I didn't know how you were doing it. And I was feeling really badly about myself because I, I cannot get to where you, where I thought that you were. And I said, no, you know, and so there's this interesting thing where we, when we are authentic, we grant permission for other people to, to say the things that are true for them, especially as leaders and parents. So I'm going to, I'll leave it with that because you guys are doing great. But I just thought it was a really relevant story where I actually got the feedback from my employees who were like, thank you for being honest about the fact that you are drained and unable to do this because we weren't keeping up and then we just felt bad. So one of the reasons we decided to come together and present on this topic is because of our own experience of challenge and difficulty juggling roles. Uh, the same experience that I'm sure many of you are having. I'm sure that Maggie's experience is, is relatable. Um, so trauma-informed response is, is not a closed book. It's a fluid learning experience that requires ongoing self-awareness, awareness of others, and compassion for all who are involved. I'd like you to take a moment and reflect on what are you seeing in others or yourself that is need suggested. So think about how you are experiencing the world differently. What's different about your day to day? What have you observed in your children at home as different that Given our explanation of trauma and alarm response that's neurologic and, and automatic, what are you seeing that suggests they have some needs that are not where they used to be before COVID-19? Um, so needs suggestive. A lack of motivation? Yes, yes. So, People have said to me and in, in my calls with families, I don't even know why that I would get out of my pajamas. Uh, I don't even know why that uh, I would go outside and, and be active. I just don't have the motivation for that. Uh, many, many of us, uh, little people included, are experiencing increased anxiety, right? And so when we have that experience, not only is it exhausting over time, it puts us in a place of greater reactivity. Um, my son Nolan said sarcastically to me, probably last week after he asked me a question about his schoolwork, I said, I think you should read it again. He says this, thanks. I thought I was gonna lose my mind. <laughs> Um, uh, by the way, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you, Ms. Campbell, for taking care of my baby. Um, he is difficult at times, right? We have a greater awareness and appreciation for teachers than we may have ever had before. And so typically, I would be calm and come close to Nolan and say, tell me what you're feeling right now. But instead, uh, I did not go that way. Um, I needed to exit. I need to pause and wait in my safe space, which happened to be like face down on my bed for a few minutes because I was like, I, I'm so mad and I understand <laughs> that maybe that behavior he demonstrated is natural and not that big of a deal, but I feel like it's a really big deal right now. So thank you for mentioning, yes, they have increased anxiety. They are more reactive um, to things that normally wouldn't bother them. Perhaps if, if your children are introverts, they have withdrawn uh, to a greater degree than you would see typically from them. Some of the challenge we face in supporting our non-traditional learning is, is related to the difficulty that every brain has when, they're in a, when your brain's in an alarm response of focusing, staying on task, um, and having value around that task completion, right? Uh, so 
the COVID fog or the alarm response that we're experiencing makes it difficult to focus. It makes it difficult to manage activities. Thanks so much for sharing in the chat window. It's really helpful. You can move forward in the presentation slide. <laughs> Go ahead, Bradley. Can I jump in just a moment? Um, I just want to comment on uh, just a few of the the, the chat and, and just from an experience I had with an adolescent that um, I have been seeing throughout all of this. And, you know, the experience at home on March 6th, probably different than where we are on May 4th. And some of all of the adolescents that I see and teenagers were, were a little more keen on being off from school back in March. Well, not as keen, here we are two months later. And one in particular this weekend talked to me about, he, this is what he said. He said, I feel like I'm staring at four white walls. And it's not just because he can't go to school, it's because he can't do anything else. And um, free time, if you have a lot of free time, uh, may not seem so free after a while. The other thing I want to comment on is the, the, the Beth Jones uh, comment. Uh, I have a two-year-old, almost three-year-old. She's having trouble with meltdowns. Sometimes she doesn't want to go outside and her attachment to daddy has greatly increased. This brings to mind another thing that I've noticed is that with some parents, and it's not just daddies, it might be mommies, but you've got parents that are all home right now. And so children are migrating to different parents. And that is creating, um, I wouldn't say a rift, but it's creating a nuance that is becoming difficult, it's just adding to the stress, you know, um, because sometimes if it's a parent that's used, not used to being at home parenting, there are different parenting styles. In fact, I had another client this week talking about how that, that her parenting style was to come, on a scale of one to 10, if the child did action A, well, she might come at a, in at a level two discipline, but her husband's coming in at a level 10 <laughs> because they're not on the same page. But now that they're at home together all the time, some of that is uh, becoming more transparent. So I just felt like when I saw some of these quotes, uh, I, I think we, we just, we're just skimming the surface in terms of cause and effect and cause and effect and this over here affects this over here. I just wanted to throw that in. Thanks, Patricia. So I'd like you to come back with me for a moment to uh, Nolan's uh, very sweet sarcasm. Um, in that moment, uh, receiving that, I had to pause and, and create a space to kind of process and, and reset my neurological response to that. And part of that is recognizing the need that is present. Clearly Nolan needed a break, right? He needed a brain break. He needed to go outside, play basketball, ride his bike. He did not need me to say to him again, you should reread Ants Go Marching. Yeah, that's not what he was looking for. He was looking for validation. He was looking for compassion. And that was his way of communicating that in the moment. And I'd like us to consider assessing our expectations for task completion, ability to focus, motivation in regard to our children's experience. Um, 
they are deserving of compassion, as are we. And it's good to invite them to talk about their experience and feelings and thinking around uh, non-traditional learning, around fear, around loss, around grief, around disconnectedness. And you will find that they are far more prepared to talk about it than you may have imagined. So now is the time to be flexing compassion and forgiveness with both our children and with ourselves as caregivers. Something that helps with this situation, I think, to promote a feeling of safety and calm is a routine that's predictable. That is also something that can be somewhat flexible given the goals for the day, right? So normally my kids are allowed to cook lunch. They're allowed to use the stove. Not today because I don't want there to be a fire during our time together that I could not attend to. So I've communicated those expectations. They are with me. I've said this is important. I would prefer not to be interrupted. So just be thinking about what's fair, what's realistic, and have I effectively communicated both the routine and my expectations for a given day. One of the ways that we can grow towards better uh, response and communicating is by exploring through observation, inviting communication, listening closely and fully for what they are delivering about their own needs that may be unmet, and then responding in a validating way to what they are sharing. So I'd like for you to think about now, what does it look like to be okay right now? What does it look like for you? Maybe what does it look like for a co-parent? What does it look like for your children? Yes, being able to acknowledge my kids instead of fix them. Yes, acknowledge where they are in that moment. We're not always ready to do the problem solving that is necessary, but it's also not always necessary, as Nolan taught me this week. Patricia, I think, I, I, go ahead. I, I think that I would add, you know, this idea of what does res listening, responding, inviting, something that you and I talked about in this culture surrounding this pandemic now, there's a lot of combativeness. You know, I'm right, you're wrong. And that that's in the media, that's in, that's in, in you might even find it in the grocery store. And so what happens is, I think there's a tendency, even in the home, to, um, to, to yeah, but, right? But it's not politics. It's not uh, something that needs to be won. It's, it's more like, yes, and. You, you, you are feeling this way. It takes a little more time. Uh, and it, it may require a little more patience, but the payoff on the back end, uh, I believe, is worth it. Uh, point being that let's be careful about bringing the combativeness and the dysfunction of uh, culture of politics into the home. Uh, if your kid's feeling it, they're not wrong. That's their feeling, and feelings are never wrong. Someone added um, struggling with letting their kid do things or parent in a way that they normally wouldn't. And so they're, they're doing it, but then struggling on the back end with that. And I think we can all relate to that one. And 
oftentimes there's a perspective shift that I offer myself. So if my kids have watched a lot of TV, if I have not been able to spend, you know, my goal, like quality time with them, my one-on-one -on -one attachment time with them that I normally would have because I did, not because I didn't have the time, because we all have plenty of that now, but because I would not have shown up in that in a meaningful way. And, you know, I think that, so when I then feel guilty about those things, I often remember, especially as a woman, that modeling self-care is so deeply important for my kids. Because if the highest measure of love that I can give my kids is selflessness, then I'm teaching my daughters and my kids to be selfless as an act of love, which we all know, like this old adage, you cannot pour from an empty cup. And so we don't want to teach our children that martyring ourselves as parents is what love looks like, right? Love is different from that. And so the perspective shift for me is, okay, you let the kids watch a ton of TV today. Would you normally do that? Is that your best? No, but did you model self-care for yourself? Yes. And so that's always like a helpful response to me to deal kind of with what I, like the mom guilt or the parent guilt. I think in the same way that we are observing and trying to be more aware of our children, we need to turn that on ourselves. And Jill Rogers, who is a school psych here in Clark County, made this comment earlier, and it's really valuable. And one of the take home lessons today is that maybe what worked before to be restorative for you isn't working as well right now because you are experiencing a greater deal of stressors and loss. And so it may be the time that you try new ways of engaging in self-care and turning compassion inward so that you can practice and model coping effectively. Thank you, Jill, for being here. I'd also like to hearken back to Bradley's yes and. I think you should be able to see this yes and image on your screen. And this is really about validation to some degree. When we talk to people, sometimes we can say, yeah, but, right? And in our own way, we're trying to help. And what that does, consequently, is shut people down in their communication. We can use this yes and strategy to be both present and validating when our children and when others are bringing their concerns forward. Yes and means yes, we can feel grateful and we can feel disappointed about many things, about graduations, about prom, about not having sleepovers. Yes, we can enjoy time with loved ones. We can practice gratitude and we can also acknowledge that this can feel overwhelming at times. We can be hopeful. We can focus on the things that are within our control to restore our sense of empowerment and, and our capability to function more normally. And at times, it's okay to feel like everything is falling apart. That's really normal. And we can be a source of support for others. And we can also prioritize our needs and fill our own cup. And that might look a little different now. It might be a greater challenge given some of the restrictions that are in place. But there are many things that we have access to that remain in our control. Things like our faith, things like our relationship with our children, with our partners, with our work families. Those are things within your control that you can lean into right now. That helps with returning to that calm space too. So when we talk about self-care and turning compassion inward, we also can think about the flight attendant analogy and that just like we are all experiencing the same storm, if we were all together on a flight, 
it would be important that we pull down our air mask and support our own breathing so that we may help the people sitting around us, right? So now is the time on your own ship, wherever you may be, <laughs> to think about what is it that you can do to promote your own forgiveness, to drop some of the parent guilt that we cling to from time to time, to recognize that this is a process, right? And it's, there's going to be some guess and check work here. And additionally, to recognize when what we're doing is not working, either for us, for our partners, for our employers, or for our children. Bradley spoke about being authentic earlier, and I do think that's really powerful. Um, it's a way of offering yourself and vulnerability that is really a safe way to communicate your own needs. And the reality that we're all having difficulty in the storm. I think another way that we can practice self-care is by re-engaging in things that used to be part of our daily lives. In the same way that we are still encouraging our kiddos to take showers, that we are still encouraging our kiddos to eat healthy foods, that we are still encouraging both ourselves and others to move for wellness. Um, and I think too, there's great importance and impact when we can experience gratefulness. Bradley, can you say more on that? Bradley, you're muted. That might have been the highlight of the whole presentation right there. Should I tell them the story, Patricia, that uh, when you and I were putting this together, that my phone died and I continued to talk for 15 minutes. I won't do that right now. Um, We're both very passionate about uh, the webinar series and he sure. just was letting that be known. Very passionate. Uh, no, in terms of gratitude, I think that uh, it can be helpful to write some things down. You know, you and I talked about that and you might think, you know, uh, what kid wants to write more stuff down? But uh, maybe it doesn't start with them. Maybe it starts with us. You know, Maggie talked about what can be modeled. You know, uh, yeah, if, if I took the time to scribble down on a scrap piece of paper or a post-it note, two or three things that I'm grateful for, or how about this, just glad about every day, that gets that ball rolling. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know that, uh, that any of us, I, I'm not endorsing whistling in the dark. Uh, but, you know, I'm looking out my window now, and it is a beautiful spring day. Sometimes, uh, you know, because this, this really hit us at the beginning of spring, and there have been days when I've walked outside and I've thought, you know, how can this crisis be going on when the weather is so wonderful? Uh, sometimes gratitude, guys, is no more than mindfulness. Being present, being right in the moment, and appreciating you know, what is. Uh, I'll tell you this, Patricia, the more, the longer this goes on, uh, a lot of people find the silver lining. A lot of people have been grateful that things have slowed down. A lot of people have been grateful for the time uh, to get reconnected with, as, uh, as Thomas Hopkins said in his last post, with, with who they really are. Uh, perhaps, the purpose of all of us is to be ourselves, whatever that is. Um, so, but if, just to fine tune all that, I think sometimes writing some things down can be very instructive because it goes from here to here. Thank you, Bradley. So I think we have 
maybe a specific framework on what it looks like to be at our best. And we need to level set our expectations of that for ourselves and for our children and for our spouses. We need to think about where we are with our own needs being met and take action towards fulfilling those needs and maybe a new and different way. I think also that we need to recognize that our best can change from day to day. We may have more needs to move physically. We may have more needs to connect emotionally or mentally. We may have a need for greater commitment and conversation with God. Doing your best might be 60% of what it was before. And that doesn't have to create some added pressure for you to rise up. It gives us an opportunity to share and connect like we are today and to have conversations that are very real and authentic about the experience we're having and the way out of it. Trisha, the way just, to connectedness. I'm just gonna add here that um... So I'm a well-being expert, and one of the ways that I level set well-being for people is by talking about instead of viewing well-being as some distant version of yourself that has achieved all of the proper lifestyle functions of health and well-being that we would think of typically, instead thinking of it as kind of a light that you hold throughout the day and the things that amplify that light how do you invest in those? And the things that diminish that light, not even solving for them, but just really responding to them and becoming aware of them. And some of them you may choose to solve. They, maybe they need. Some of them you may choose to just invest less in, like if it's a relationship, like somebody who maybe wants to text or, or video chat more these days and, and all they do is complain and you're like, oh, like, it just really drains me. And so not only is like our well-being and self-care, well, self-care is really a function of paying attention to that light and what's occurring with it. And so it's really something that's quite fluid that you can move in and out of in a day or within the hour. And so, you know, paying attention to those things um, or to that light, that self-care is so valuable right now because it really and brings us closer to the core of our needs than when we start thinking like, well, I didn't run today and I didn't prepare a healthy meal for the family and I didn't, you know, and I think if you start paying attention even to our kids in that way, like, okay, what just happened that tanked this kid's light? Because <laughs> they're pretty sassy right now. So I think that it helps us right now think differently about self-care than we would have pre-COVID-19 self-social distancing. One of the other things that we hope to share today is the opportunity that you have both locally and abroad to connect with healthcare providers that will support your emotional wellness. Uh, that could look like counseling. It could look like uh, talking with a nutritionist, it could look like a coach of some sort to support your wellness. So one of the resources affiliated with the webinar is a web page that includes a variety of things. Um, many things from the Clark County Public School District have been shared and they've done a great job at compiling resources for families. So I encourage you to visit that web page and access that. We've also included information from the local community mental health providers about how you can access care for your children or for others. And we'll continue to post updates about how may, that may look different as time goes on and different restrictions are in place. So, in your response to kiddos who clearly have some need that's not being met, remember that it's okay to ask, what do you need? What would feel good to you right now? And give them time and space to reply. 
Um, you can also encourage connection and quality time with them with some set expectation about this is when I'm available and this is what we can do. You can choose. Choices are empowering. That gives us a sense of control that's restorative. Choices can bring us back into that place of calm. So invite your children to make choices about how you spend quality time with them. Now is the time where we want to continue answering questions. So please, uh, if you want to ask questions from anyone present in the meeting, go ahead and use your chat box now for that. One of the other tools that Maggie and I discussed is offering an, a journaling opportunity to students and children. Um, some children will be diabolically opposed to that uh, because they hate journaling and, and know that's okay too, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be writing, it can be drawing. Also, if they tell you there's no chance I wanna do that, respect that, that's not where they are in that moment. Um, and there are a lot of prompts online that will help them to kind of filter out their feelings and thoughts on paper. You can use Pinterest. There are tons of, of resources. If you're into Facebook right now, there are a lot of parent resources that you can access. But getting things out and onto paper physically, whether it's through art, through some art project, or through storytelling, that's powerful to children. And it gives them a voice that can be heard um, that they may not be able to express verbally in a situation. Trisha, there was a question. Uh, what advice do we have on adjusting post COVID-19? I think we have to have some recognition that we're not returning to normal. Bradley and I spoke about this before. The experience that we're going back into after restrictions have been released is one that has been influenced and impacted since March 6th, right? So we're going into that with new knowledge, with new stressors that maybe weren't there previously as related to contagion and germs and social distancing. So when we return, we need to relinquish some of those expectations that we're going back to the place we were in our functioning when we left work in March, even if it was just physically leaving work and you're working at home. Even if your work became different because you're now in charge of caregiving throughout the day when normally that's something that you're not experiencing because the kids are in school. So level setting your own expectations in the return to work, having conversations about the limitations that might be in place, given your continued responsibility for child care, and perhaps continued responsibility for elder care if you have older family members that you are staying connected to and providing care for. Having answers to important questions will also help you to feel more in control. So, when I return to work, how are the expectations for productivity different, right? Is there flexibility in my schedule so that I might be able to switch shifts with uh, my co-parent where he's at home during the day and I'm at home during the evening. We both still work eight hours. It's just at a different time of day. So think about what your needs are going to be in the return to work process with forgiveness in advance for the difficulty that the new experience after COVID-19 will bring? That's an excellent question. Thank you for presenting it.
I think I would just add too that, you know, we've learned a lot of new skill sets um, so that we can take good care of ourselves in this time. And I think that my advice would be to carry those forward because they've been, they've been really meaningful for us. And I think in our, in our busyness and kind of our, our numbness that before, there's been things that we have um, become aware of in, in, our, in this version of life that we're living right now. And I think that it's okay to take those things with you because I think that there's no way that you can just unlearn those things or, or leave them behind. So, um, you know, it's okay to think similarly when we return. And I think when it comes to parenting, in addition to thinking about going back to work, I think that there's going to be this really interesting transition for our kids where they're really curious about what does it look like to go back and, and what does it all mean? Like, you know, I, my oldest is nine. And so like their ability to process this is, is different. And I think that there will just be a lot of like, like for them, it's like, well, when is social distancing ending is their question that they keep asking. And, and we don't have an answer to that right now. And, and then it's hard to say, well, well, the governor said, you know, May 25th ish, and maybe, you know, after that, we'll see how it goes, but maybe it will go back, but you know, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, just being really present to the turbulence that this creates for them and the amount of unknown involved for kiddos. Patricia, if, if I could just, to echo what Maggie said. And, you know, I, I, I think about what, what can we learn from this? And there's a lot. Uh, I've, I've often thought, what is this virus? What is this disease attacking? It's attacking the immune system. It is most fatal to compromised immune systems. So going forward, what can we do to build up immune systems. You know, does that mean rest? Does that mean sleep, uh, sleep rest? Does that mean activity? Does that mean vegetables? Does that mean prayer for some people? Does that mean washing our hands and washing our bodies? Does that mean being careful what we touch, who we touch, how we touch? I think it's all of that. Just because May 25th comes or January 1st comes or a vaccine is developed. There are things that we can learn from all of this and carry it forward to build immune systems. Yes, it is difficult when you're uncertain about your child's ability to fully understand what's going on. Remember, too, that most of us are in a position where we don't fully understand what's going on. We're getting a lot of mixed messages. And the more mixed messages we receive, the more confusion sets in. So I would encourage you to, to do some limit setting around exposure to the news and social media wherever possible because that just adds to the confusion and can put children in a place where they do feel like they're not in a safe situation. I think too reassurance that even though this is confusing and we're not sure exactly when changes will bring us closer to pre-COVID-19 that we can extend uh, emphasis on things within the child's control, right? And when we focus on things within our control and be present in the moment, instead of kind of forecasting what's to come in the future or um, creating some worry fantasy as a result of our anxiety, if we can return our focus to things within our control, like our faith, gratitude practice, skill set, resources, ability to connect and experience love and belonging, that is restorative for us. And that can bring us back to a place of calm and a place 
where your children can experience more security. There are things within your control and within their control that will emphasize an experience of confidence and safety. So think about what that looks like for them. Present the options that, is, um, that are empowering to them and listen. Remembering that problem solving is not always necessary. Thank you for your time today. I know it's a very valuable commodity right now as we're all juggling many things. And I would like to encourage you to reach out to us uh, via email or um, through connection at the next webinar, which is Wednesday at noon for those in education um, with those other questions that may come up. Thank you so much for being here.